Hi, everybody. So, thanks for the nice introduction. My name is Stefan Berger. I represent about the gist of hundreds of incident response cases, um, a little bit of content. We don't have much time, so Kickstart works smarter, not harder, streamline the process. What else about me? Um, I'm running an incident response team in Switzerland, so my day in, day out job is doing incident response. I love doing incident response. I love being a blue teamer. You can follow me on different social platforms. Um, so the, the motivation for this talk was when I'm conducting job interviews for people who want to join my team or become an incident responder, one of the first question I ask them, how do you start an investigation? Given the fact that a customer calls you and asks, hey, my, my network is compromised, 5K plus host, 10K plus host, where do you start? In most times, it's just the candidates just felt silent. They don't have a clue where to start in bigger networks. They might be familiar with conducting forensics or incident response in smaller networks, one server, two server compromise, but when it comes to really large networks, enterprise networks, forensics, at scale, most candidates lack the knowledge. This talk is really just an introduction about my process. I love to speed things up about how I can show, I can take shortcuts because sometimes I'm lazy, <laughs> as we will see in the presentation. So all it starts with a kickstart. So at one point, the customer calls us in a total panic and say, my network is maybe compromised. Maybe I found a backdoor on my domain controller. Maybe we found suspicious behaviors, just conducting from the analysis of the antivirus locks. So the first thing we do in my company, or my company at the company I work for, InfoGuard, is rolling out the forensic agents to gain visibility. Visibility is one of the keywords. I really believe in it because I saw multiple incident response cases and reports from different companies, I'm not naming them here, because the problem, the main problem is sometimes I think that companies or people in internal security teams are only conducting forensics on single point servers or systems. Just given the fact that once you have an, an intruder, intruder in your network and an attacker inside your network, you cannot be sure that the network will be ever be clean if you only conduct forensics on one system. I've worked on multiple cases in multiple networks where the attacker placed five plus backdoors on different servers. And that was not only Cobalt Strike or malicious tools. We name also remote monitoring solutions like Anydesk, Terra, also system BCs, legitimate PowerShell scripts, which make a back connect to servers. So when you don't conduct a really in-depth investigation of that whole network, when you don't place forensic agents or EDR tools on every computer and every server in that network and do an examination of these servers, you cannot be sure that you will not miss a backdoor there. So the question is, where do I start, right? <laughs> yeah, it's easy. Just bring a, bring a, bring a big, um, big magnet to find the needle in a haystack. No, on a serious note, one of the first places I look once I get visibility into a network is look at the antivirus locks. Always. I would say 99% I find a first hit in the antivirus locks. In that case here, so in the left corner you see the batch real incident. I have a lot of slides with real incident data. I hope I redacted it correctly because of the customer names. No, it should be good. So in that case here, the antivirus on that particular server screen more than 300 times. I have a problem here. I have a problem here. Malicious code here, malicious code here. Nobody paid attention. And that's, that's in most cases, I'm doing incident response. I see traces from the attacker in five minutes. Just looking at the antivirus, antivirus logs, I see compromised user accounts, I see staging directories, I see a timestamp when the attacker was active inside the network. This gives me, within a few hours or few minutes, good insight in the case, and I have first indicators of compromise I can work it. I think it's totally, really totally underrated. Yeah, I don't mind the, the screenshot here from the platform we don't have, we don't name. <laughs> the name we don't speak about or the platform we don't speak about. I talked multiple times about antivirus locks, how fruitful antivirus locks can be. So really companies should pay attention. If you don't monitor your antiviruses today, please start tomorrow or today. Monitor for keywords, highly relevant keywords as outlined by Florian Roth. When you see a inside your power um, inside your antivirus locks keywords like backdoor like cobalt strike like meaty preacher on server systems for example you might have really a serious problem 
One of the next underrated artifacts, in my opinion, are PowerShell logs. How many companies really analyze and ingest PowerShell logs in their CM and their workflow and they analyze those PowerShell logs? I personally think start today analyzing PowerShell logs. The next thing besides antivirus logs, I look at the PowerShell logs. I find so much fruitful information and juicy stuff there from the attackers. For example, here, that was also from a real incident from a case I worked on. PowerShell logs showed us that the attacker um, placed a backdoor within the registry which ran PowerShell code, which connected back to a server from the attacker. Just looking at the PowerShell logs, we see a system net socket, TCP client connection. That's, in quotes, easy to find if you really do an analysis of the PowerShell logs. Collect all the PowerShell logs from your network, do a little analysis, which well, exactly for IP addresses or just for malicious keywords. Next one I look at is services. Services, just look at the event logs, which services were created in the last time or in the last week, in the last month, or in the time frame the attacker was active on the network. What you're seeing here are random service names, just do a stacking inside your network. So service name which are unique inside your network might be a sign of a malicious activity. Or Comspec, for example, we see run DLL, which started DLL with the uh, appendix THT. That doesn't look like really uh, a regular DLL, does it? And also remote, remote monitoring, management, or RMM tools, and also vulnerable drivers. So keep that in mind so that an attacker can do a privilege escalation on systems. In a lot of cases, they install a vulnerable driver, which comes as a service, and they exploit that driver to gain or to, to raise the privileges on the system. Auto runs, anyone's. Everybody loves auto runs, right? But you have to be careful. This one is also from a real incident. What we are seeing here is a service. It's called a non-sucking service manager. That's not a malicious tool. That service just makes sure that once your application crash or dies, that it gets respawned. As an analyst, when you're working on a SOC or incident response team and you see, oh, well, image path downloads nssm.exe, the non-sucking service manager is not particularly malicious. And you look at that tool and you see, okay, that might be fine. Well, it turns out it's not, not at least in that case here. So the tool was used to spawn ngrok. So ngrok is also a remote, a remote backdoor tool frequently used by attackers. And uh, the thing is, when you just look at the logs here, but the outer runs output, you see only the string non-sucking service manager. But you have to be careful and you have to really pinpoint the paths which get loaded inside the registry. So the thing here is, don't rely too much on the tools, but think for yourself as well. Otherwise, you might miss critical data. My approach is work smarter, not harder, because incident response in my opinion, is really time critical. In most cases, a customer doesn't call us because they want to have chit chat or they are just pleased to, to burn some hours with us. <laughs> we are costly. Um, so in most cases, the, either way, the, the, the network is encrypted or they find really malicious activity on their network. So we are kind of under pressure to really conduct a forensic examination as fast as possible. So what I love to do is taking shortcuts. Uh, in my first five few slides, I talked about get, getting up to speed with the investigation, finding first hits. One of the tools I love is Hayabusa. What Hayabusa does is it really grinds through the whole file system, through the event logs, searching for patterns with Yara rules um, or regexes to find malicious entries in those logs, event logs, file system, whatever. At the same tool is also Detect Raptor. I'm sure. A lot of people in this room are familiar with Velociraptor. I love Velociraptor. We use it daily, mostly. Direct Raptor does the same as Ayabusa. It conduct like first examinations of potential malicious activity based on the master file table, based on event logs, based on network connection and whatever. This is not a replacement for a full forensic examination, keep that in mind. Once you found first hits of an attack, be it on the service event logs, be it in the anti-runs, be it also in the antivirus logs, you must conduct a deep dive. 
So the whole forensic process is really rinse and repeat. Find traces of an attacker, do a, a deep dive on the attacker system or the, the, the system touched by the attackers or pwned by the attacker, and then do a hunting for that IOC you found on that system or those systems throughout the network to really gain more traces by the attacker. By searching for more traces by the attacker, you find more systems which might be compromised and do a deep dive there. In that whole process, in the whole, whole circle, you can really find all the traces by the attacker. Streamline the process. Like I said, it's not feasible to conduct really just analysis of one host by two hosts, given that you have 10K plus endpoints in, one, uh, in a network. How do you conduct like a cape? Um, so well, let's say you are, your work, your, um, you're using CAPE for conducting forensic examinations, how you do a CAPE examination on 10K plus endpoints. So what we are doing is we roll out forensic agents inside the network, Velociraptor. Those Velociraptor agents, they start with different tons, so we're collecting a ton of data, antivirus logs, outruns, PowerShell security logs, network connection, yards, can you name it? You see it on the right side height. That's only a real, a small subset of all the data we are collecting. These data get automatically pushed to a CM, which we build in hours, in days, in, in weeks, dashboards for automatic analysis of those data. What's so practical about this approach is I can go to my CM with a practical dashboard, I can click around and I see a PowerShell artifacts dashboard. Within that dashboard, malicious activity is easily recognizable. So here, for example, we see the download string HTTP 127, so localhost with a port. That's typical Cobalt Strike load behavior. So that's a clear indicator that somebody is with Cobalt Strike on that host, right? Instantly, you see that behavior when you just collect the logs and you have the right tools to analyze those logs in time and efficiently. Same goes for password spraying. Just collecting all the event logs, the security event logs, I see instantly the failed logins from which account on which host. I don't have to examine all this data manually, collect the data manually, just roll forensic agents, collect the data, push the data to a CM and build dashboards. You see evil behavior instantly. I love that, really. Same goes for ex external IP address. How many times, that's also from, an, from a real incident, how many times have I found external IP address inside the um, security event logs, successful logins? That's also a sign for attackers. It must not be always malicious, but it could be malicious and give you a hint that some, somebody is inside your network. If you do not check for suspicious locations, if you are following me online on my various uh, social media accounts, you know that I'm a big fan of praying or praising that, that thing here again. Just look for placed executables in C users, public in C users, username desktop or, or music or whatever. You might struck gold here if you conduct such a search inside your network and even doing instant response. Because attackers, they love placing executables in different folders, in public reachable folders. And this is one, one of the really cool artifacts and really one of the powerful hunts we are losing. So here, exactly for suspicious locations, you will see different staging folders where the attacker abused it or placed the executable files there. Again, how would you find or conduct such an investigation on a large-scale network if you don't have the right tools and also the right data to conduct that? Here's RepFox, shout out to Roman Hussi, also a Swiss like I am, who really, Mm, have so much for the community. This one here is from ThreadFox, one of the, one of the projects from Roman where he collected a ton of data from C2s, from malware, etc., placed it online. I would really recommend that you as defenders, if you're running a CM or a security team, that you download this data and enrich 
your data, your network data. What we did is we collect all the network information with Netstat from the host. We have an EDR or a Velociraptor agent on it. We push that Netstat data in, in a CM, in that case here in Splunk, and we enrich the data with, um, with information from Roman, from ThreadFox or from abuse.ch. Instantly, we can filter for malicious connections. I don't have to think about that process. I don't have to invest one brain cell to click here. But I see instant malicious connections if there are any connections to well-known C2 ports and IP addresses. So, case solved. <laughs> Talk over. No, not yet. <laughs> Um, let me let me use the time to talk about new artifacts which might not be that common. Because also when I'm conducting interviews with candidates for incident response, I ask them question about do you know about the bitmap cache? Sometimes they do not. So bitmap cache is really really a powerful forensic artifact in my opinion. Because what you are looking here is also from a, a real incident when an attacker remotely logs into a server with the RTP protocol, they might leave traces inside the bitmap cache. So what we are seeing here is a glimpse over the shoulder of the attackers. So what the attackers saw on the remote desktop server gets locked inside the bitmap cache. We can use the bitmap cache with various tools to extract those data. It's a, it's a little like a jigsaw, like you see here. You have to really zoom in to extract juicy data. But in more than one incident, we were able to see breached user accounts the attacker used, which uh, with a common C, with a CMD shell, for example. But we also found passwords to data exfiltration sites. These passwords and usernames we pass later on to law enforcement, and they could do a takedown of the data, of the exfiltrated data. So ANSI, for example, open source the BMC tool, which is a really great tool. We use it also a lot in our cases. That's what I meant when I said do a deep dive. Once you, ex once you um, found a host compromised by the attackers, used all the data left by the attackers, or all the artifacts you can use to really do a deep dive on the forensic inf information. Same goes for SRAM. That's also a really cool artifact. When you see here the task manager, you see the usage history from all the tools. Why is that useful for the forensic information? Well, for example, we find traces of the tools used by the attackers. What you're seeing here is Steelbit. Also, that from a real incident, that's the name of the exfiltration tool used by the attackers. Of course, we have different artifacts, like, for example, all the, um, the evidence of execution left by the attackers. But this is one of the other places you could look at if the attacker have done some kind of anti-forensics, tampering with the log files, deleted log files. There is always a place where you might find other artifacts on the system. I personally am a strong believer that an attacker cannot be that stealthy to fly really under the radar. Once you delete logs, you leave traces in the event logs that you deleted the logs. Once you deleted these logs, you might find traces in different artifacts like the SRAM here. There are other places we might find or we might struck forensic gold. This one here is a defender alert from a, from a real incident as well. Just looking at it at first, I think, okay, suspicious remote copy. Mm -hmm. Gives me good information, no additional actions required. What exactly happens? So this one is, this log file here is from the standard defender log file. Doesn't give up that much information, right? There's a thing called MP logs. If you don't know about MP logs, please look it up. CrowdStrike made an, a fantastic blog about it. It's called the Microsoft Protection Logs. Inside the Microsoft Protection Logs, I see further details about the detection. I see PowerShell, Bitsubmin, um, and I see the full command line with an IP address. So even if Windows said, or just gave me that little information here, I detected something malicious. If you're not aware of the MP logs, you might miss a ton of critical data. That's what I meant for you have to be really careful when you do forensic examinations because when you're not that experienced, you might just look at the 
alert uh, on my previous slide and think, okay, I will move on, nothing to see here. But that's not true. Use as much forensic inf information as you can when conducting forensic examinations. Track the attacker. Again, <laughs> I'm, I'm praising or teaching that so for so long. Please, when you are collecting your VPN logs or your DHCP logs, um, create a search for outliers on your host name. Most of the companies, they have a prefix or a company name or the host names are aligned with the, with the naming convention of the company. In tons of cases, I saw that once attacker breached the network, they use VPN connections, the legitimate VPN connections to connect with their own tools to the network. They get an IP address, they get a DHCP lease, once they get a DHCP or IP address, they leak their internal host names. And the host name will not be according to the host name convention used by the company. What we are seeing is Windows, so Win minus, Desktop minus, or just random. Multiple times. I personally, I don't really understand why company are not using like really easy searches for, for finding malicious stuff on the network. Everybody is talking about we need the latest, greatest EDR tools. We need the latest, greatest machine learning algorithms to find evil. But these are really basics. And in my experience, I haven't saw a company which really collects the VPN logs, DHCP logs and do such simple analysis as here. That could be like in 10 minutes, I would say I've got somebody else in my network because I don't know that host name. Again here, that's from a real incident, VPN locks desktop. Also one of the hunts I do frequently when I ask a customer to, or a comp company ask to do a incident response, I ask them, give me the VPN locks. And with such simple searches, I find IP addresses of the attackers in no time. So patient zero, the traces we found in the kickstart and later deep dive sessions were not created out of thin air on the system. Surprise, of course, they must, they must, um, the attacker must land somewhere on the network. What we are doing is we really pinpoint the attacker back. Once we found first traces of the attacker inside the network, we point him back to the patient zero, which might be like a first stage infection on a computer or a phishing link and they used the, um, the leak credentials to log into VPN, etc. What else? Because this is one, this, this talk is about the lessons learned from instant response. Soft skills. It's underrated. I have so many people who want to break into instant response and they said, I'm a really cool technician so I want to just be all day long in front of the computer. Instant response is not about just being a technical expert, it's about also being good with people. Because I spend countless hours just arguing with the upper management, arguing with people, delegating tasks, explaining stuff to people. So instant response is not only about just grinding through the locks, but also talking to people, have patient, be like a good listener, because you come into the company on, in times of highly pressure and, and stressful environment. So you must take a step back and listen to the people and just be a good listener and try to relieve some of the stress. Delegate tasks. I saw multiple times that analysts just be overwhelmed with all the tasks become where when you're doing an incident response case or when you're the manager of an incident response team, you might have the urge to really consolidate all the tasks on your chest, on your back. So that's wrong because when I'm doing incident response, my, my phone is, is chirping all the time. My mailbox gets flooded by the customer. I have a, an update meeting in one hour and in that one hour time frames, I also have to do like 20 hunts. I have to analyze or all the data I have to analyze. So that's also a pro tip. Don't be shy to ask for help. You cannot do that alone, not given when you have to conduct a forensic examination of an enterprise network. It's not a sign of weakness to ask for help. When you're overloaded, when doing incident response, you make mistakes. Mistakes lead to overlook backdoors, which lead to re-entry of the attackers two days later. Resource management, as I said, I'm a manager, not only a manager, but also a technician, but I'm leading a team of 10 people, of 10 incident responders, and burnout is really a thing. 
So please be careful, not only in incident response, but also in the whole tech industry, that you take time for your family, for sports, if you are into it, or just for hobbies, get some time off the screen, and really, yeah. I think it's, <laughs> it's, it's really super important. The older I get, the more I think resource management, also your personal health is so important, so please keep that also in mind. So the conclusion of that task is, Instant response, a combination of deep technical knowledge, project management skills, people management, and again, visibility is really the key. If you are conducting like single place investigations on huge networks, you might have to overthink that process, search for the first hit, work smarter, not harder, use shortcuts, use tools like Hayabusa and Velociraptor or Detect Raptor to get the first hit and then do a deep dive there and investigate, deep dive, and track back the attacker. That was it. So we still have room for questions. Thank you very much for the uh, very, very interesting talk. Uh, you, you seem to be taking a very uh, end point uh, um, stand, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and you said, because in your experience, most of the time they cannot really, you know, hide everything or remove everything. Mm -hmm. But still, you, I was surprised you have not mentioned anything like DNS logs or DLP appliances or connections logs or firewall logs, you know, people trying to uh, punch a hole with UPnP or something like that. Yeah. Isn't that in your experience any, any, anything really, or DSN, DNS logs, uh, you know, this kind of stuff? Isn't that useful or um, you, you don't need it because in your experience um, you find everything you need on the host? So the question was if DNS logs are not useful, they are. They are really useful. In my experience, you might get overburdened or just just too much information. When you have to start with a VPN, uh, let's just start, I give you a ton of firewall logs from two weeks or DNS logs from two weeks. Where do you start? Would you be really able to find the needle in that haystack? I personally, I love DNS logs, but combined with different information. Let's say we find Cobalt Strike on a server or a computer. We then um, extract the configuration from Cobalt Strike and there I see the DNS or the C2 address. With that information, I go back to the firewall logs and DNS logs. Of course, we use that information a lot. But in my experience, I was not always successful just given here you have like one million DNS records, find evil. Hi. Uh, Hi. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I was wondering in terms of uh, uh, feedback that you'd have, mm -hmm. in my experience, um, Deploying a forensic uh, tool on a whole um, a park, uh, a whole IT um, uh, IT perimeter uh, can be a bit uh, long, can be a bit difficult. So I was wondering whether it's because the victim doesn't uh, properly understand its network, or because they have, uh, for instance, Linux boxes with uh, 2.7 kernels turn, uh, running this kind of thing. Uh, how do you handle, uh, what were the hurdles that you met during uh, incident response uh, when deploying Velociraptor, for instance? And uh, how do you handle uh, Linux IT, uh, IT Park, for instance? Uh, links. So handle the rollout of the forensic agent? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So the question was, how do we handle the process of rolling for, which is offloaded to the customer, honestly, because every network is different. We. I make clear in the beginning it's not my responsibility to bring the agent to the network. Okay. That's why it's, it's good when customers conduct us or contact us before the incident with a retainer or just make some, some drill tests. How do, in some cases, it's really, it's really um, a challenge for, for customers to roll a forensic agent to create new firewall rules that the agent can connect back to our servers. So again, if you are running a, an internal security team, make sure you know that process.
All right, maybe just one extra point is, uh, does Vitaceraptor also run on Linux? Uh, I don't, I never really used the tool, so how do you handle uh, Linux? Uh, it Linux runs system? also on Linux, and also Mac OS. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wonder if you see uh, an evolution in your customers because not because nowadays with um, EDR solutions, I assume if they are configured correctly and uh, monitored correctly, this should not be possible to find that many uh, finds as you showed us. Is there an evolution? So the bigger customers, they must be more professional in the. I hope, or am I too, am I too naive? <laughs> It really depends. So I, I um, attended a course EDR evasion <laughs> last month in Rome, and it's definitely possible to fly under the radar of the EDR, but you still leave traces. So I love Velociraptor because you can conduct really deep type forensic examinations. An EDR is more like an observer and a monitoring tool, but Velociraptor is really a forensic tool. So it really allows you to go really deep. But you are right, of course, EDRs might pick up but they are not a civil bullet.